Good afternoon or good morning, everybody, and welcome to another Lended Fintech webinar. Today, we have a super interesting topic, how com consumer permission banking data can drive universe expansion for lenders. A little bit of a mouthful, but we're going to be delving deeply into, into this topic of um, consumer permission data. Uh, my name is Peter Renton. I'm chairman and co-founder of Lended Fintech, uh, coming at you from our studio in Denver, Colorado today. Uh, we have actually all four time zones represented on uh, in in this uh, in this webinar. And uh, before I introduce everybody, though, just a quick, just want to do a quick uh, reminder that Lender FinTech USA is happening in um, May 25th and 26th in New York City. And if you if you haven't got a ticket yet, you should go. We're going to be talking about topics like this and many more. It's it's the biggest uh, fintech event on the East Coast, and uh, we would like you to be there. And okay, so now let's uh, let's get started with introductions. Firstly, though, I want to I want to thank Nova Credit for uh, for sponsoring this webinar. And I'm just going to go across my screen here. And uh, Sarah, I will start with you if you could just do a quick intro and tell us where you are because we I want to get sort of the sense of all the four time zones. Okay, so hi, Sarah Davies, uh, Chief Data and Analytics Officer at Nova Credit. Been with the company about three and a half years. Uh, I am right now based in Delaware and uh, which is not what any of these photographs look like, but uh, it's still a beautiful place to come visit if you anybody needs to, uh, a place to stop on the East Coast. Okay, and hi, Anne. Uh, you're on mute, hi, Anne. Sorry about that. Um, That's okay. Hi, um, everyone. My name is hi, Anne Huang. I'm the head of credit and fraud in Prosper. Um, so Prosper is an online lending platform. It's one of the earliest. I joined Prosper about three years ago, um, in total about 20 years in the lending business. Um, so in Prosper, we offer personal loan, credit card, and HELOC to consumers on our digital platform. So my function is really covering all this uh, uh, machine learning models, uh, as well as credit and uh, fraud strategies. Okay, and Alpa? Great. Good morning. Good afternoon. Al Balali here. I'm based in Orange County, California. You're probably seeing the glare of the, the sunlight coming through here. Um, I currently work as um, running our data business at Experian, responsible for looking across the ecosystem for additional data assets and then partnering very closely with our data scientists to create new solutions such as models, attributes, and scores. I'm looking forward to the conversation, everyone. Okay, so um, before we dive right in, we're getting a lot of people joining here. If you have a question at any time, hit the Q and A uh, button at the bottom of your screen, and we will try and get to them all. So before we really get into the nitty gritty here, let's just talk about definitions. Maybe Sarah, you can talk about uh, what do we actually mean when we say consumer permission data? Sure, um, consumer permission data is, is essentially what the, the phrase actually says, it is data that the consumer gives permission uh, to release to the business for the lend, for lending purposes. So Nova Credit's, Credit's sort of value proposition is that we work within the space of consumer permission data. Uh, we help uh, immigrants moving over to the United States bring their foreign credit over on a consumer permission basis, and then we release that to issuers in the US. But there are other forms of consumer permission data, and that's what we're talking about today. Um, bank transaction data is, is a specifically uh, kind of an area of focus. Fundamentally, it's account level data, transaction level data that the consumer chooses to release to the lender. It provides a broader, deeper picture of the consumer's financial identity and hopefully enables the lender to give access to credit. Okay, so then, uh, Alper, I want to turn to you because you know, Experian has really been a pioneer in uh, in this type of data. So, what? Why is it important um, to Experian and your and your customers? Yeah. Um, so, Peter, you're absolutely right. Experian has been a pioneer in this space, and why it's important is because it's the most effective, one of the most effective ways that our industry can actually help drive financial inclusion. Um, it puts consumers in control of their data while helping lenders create a complete picture of their financial situation or paint that full 360 degree view. It ultimately can help lenders also say yes when they otherwise couldn't or wouldn't. 
you know, a consumer in many cases could have had a limited or even a non-existent traditional credit history, but by gaining visibility into how a consumer is managing, for example, cell phone payments or utilities or streaming services, through tools like Experian Boost, as an example, you can actually help lenders provide that, capture that information by adding that onto your credit report and become scorable. And um, lenders have that ability to then give you that second chance um, to have that opportunity to participate in you know, a variety of different financial products. So in short, it actually, consumer permission data, it makes a meaningful difference in the lives of millions of consumers, right? That kind of lack that traditional credit history. Um, and, and now that they could be either new to credit, you know, um, just turning 18 or just had to unfortunately go through some financial hardships, but it really gives them that opportunity to kind of level up and, and again, a chance to participate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So hi, and I want to turn to you because you're, you're the one, you're the lender um, on the, on this panel. So would love to get a sense of, of how you think about it at Prosper. Um, um, What, you know, what, what are your, how are you using it? What do you think about, um, how do you think about consumer permission data there? Yeah. I would say, uh, first of all, I'm in Chicago. I missed that question. <laughs> well, thank you. Yes. My team, most of my team members are in uh, the Bay Area. Yeah, so speaking of the um, customer information data, um, we consider that, consider that as a critical component for us, not just for um, trying to say like, we, I want to expand to some kind of underbanked or certain invisible or thin file population only, but also really trying to drive more uh, efficiency in the whole acquisition funnel. So to be specific, to be specific about what Sarah and uh, uh, Alpa were talking about in terms of, uh, for instance, their um, cash flow, their employment, their payroll. So all this information really brings us a lot of um, data points for us to further verify. Okay, are they who they are? Are they um, making uh, that much money as they claimed? At the same time, of course, we want to create the most frictionless funnel for those good consumers who actually are very uh, demonstrating very consistent patterns. Um, but it doesn't say all these data points are very easy to use and uh, uh, have no problems because at the same time we uh, are considering uh, FCRA compliant data points and then also at the same time to look at the overall coverage and then how the data can be leveraged in more systematic approach, such as uh, machine learning AI models. So all these are definitely, I think, not just to prosper everybody in this business are probably considering anyway. Yeah. Right, right. And we, we do want to dig into the uh, compliance question in a little bit. But um, Sarah, I want to go back to you and just love, uh, uh, you've been in this industry for, for quite some time. Um, you know, what, what has been your experience, you know, working with tools that for, for the thin file consumers? Yeah, hundreds of years, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> um, so, so looking back at that history that I've got, um, yeah, I have been in the space for a while. I, I was part of the Vantage School team for a while, and and one of the core value propositions of Vantage School was that we would build a we were building a credit score to score these uh, consumers who were sort of falling into this financially included or financial inclusion segment. I I prefer to call them actually credit excluded because I think that's kind of more brutal about what the situation is for them, and I think part of the challenge here. Is with this with the solutions and tools that are in the space is that first off there's an assumption that thin file consumers are kind of uniformly high risk um, and that's that's just so far from the truth um, you know there's there's actually all kinds of data out there that uh, shows that many of these consumers you know 50 plus million who are thin files and, and no files and a number of them are actually very good credit quality. But because there's sort of this universal perception of being high risk, there's sort of no one size fits all solution. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Vantage School will score millions of those consumers, but doing it with sparse credit file data uh, doesn't benefit from deeper data that consumer permission information can bring. There are solutions like Clarity and Factor Trust, which focus on uh, subprime consumers, rent utility, obviously relevant for, for consumers in that space, et cetera. But, but the fact that there's sort of no one size fits all solution means that you, know, you end up with varying levels of efficacy in terms of uh, coverage or scalability and in terms of accuracy. And that creates challenges in and of itself in terms of 
uh, receptivity, adoption in the industry, and even the regulatory environment is sort of uh, challenged to understand how to engage all these different solutions in a way that's sort of very, um, you know, sort of controlled and managed from a, a, a wise risk perspective. So, so there's any number of sort of dynamics, really, quite, quite frankly, I think, fundamental to it is this factor that there's sort of so many small solutions out there rather than one really robust solution. Yeah, but let's sort of just, I, I'd love to hear from, from, um, from anyone actually, what traditional credit underwriting has been around for a long time. Um, you know, we've been, it's been used very successfully um, in a multitude of industries. Um, why is it leaving out such large consumer segments still? Yeah, I, I'm happy to jump in here. So, uh, you know, to start, Peter, um, I think it's important to note that traditional credit data, it can provide lenders with excellent insights into mm -hmm. consumers' risk profile. It's still the primary means to effectively assess lending risk, right, for most American consumers. The reality is it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, but the whole point is other types of data can help lenders make more effective decisions and drive financial inclusion. And that's evolving. You know, if we look at some research that we've done with Oliver Wyman, we see that there is 106 million Americans that lack access to mainstream credit because they're credit invisible, unscorable or subprime. And 28 million of those, you know, are you know, consumers that are credit invisible, but that meaning they don't have any presence of, you know, a traditional credit history because they could be new to the country, new to credit, starting over. But without traditional credit history, lenders are really ultimately unable to access that level of risk that a consumer may represent, right? And I'll give a little bit of a personal story, you know, because the struggle is real. I'm an immigrant from Canada. It's really hard to come build a credit um, profile in the US. And there are solutions now and other types of data sources, such as you know utility and telco information, clarity data assets that can actually help lend that insights. And so you can start to participate in the credit ecosystem and that mainstream credit. So a, a really great way to start to build out your profile and your consumer perspectives or your consumer financial um, that lenders need to help assess you. Right, right. Now, I, I am also an immigrant and had uh, had the challenge of moving here and applying. I'd been here three months and applied for a $500 credit limit uh, card at Macy's and was soundly rejected, which is why I've always been so bullish on the Nova Credit uh, product and story because it's it's something that it made it makes until you're in the system it's so hard to break in and uh, and yeah. that's what uh, it was for me it just had to you know I had I mean if I hadn't had my American Express card that I actually brought over from Australia that was my sort of one my one way I could actually operate with credit but it was extremely challenging and um, so I mean and you know, so, this, Peter, this, can, I, can, can I jump in there as well? I want to on just sort of, I think Alpha makes a great point. You know, credit data is here to stay. It's an incredibly valuable tool. But part of the challenge is not just the data, the, the credit data, it's the scoring systems on top of it. Right. And so there are systems and scores in this US industry that, you know, for want of a better word, are, are just quite frankly not keeping up with the times. Uh, they require that the consumer has a sufficient amount of data in the system and a sufficiently amount of fresh data in the system in order to get a score. So even if you have, you know, one trade that you maybe don't use very frequently, you are classed as unscorable. And there's millions and millions of these 50 millions that we took with consumers that we're talking about that simply are actually have some amount of credit data, but just not enough data to get a score and become the, the no score population that we're talking about. So I think a, a huge part of why people are being excluded from the system is because we're using scores and approaches that are simply not up to date, not contemporary with what we have in the ecosystem today. Mm -hmm. Sarah, I can agree with you more. Um, it's, it's an ask out to, you know, we've evolved right over the past few years as we've brought in more and more different data assets, now consumer permission data, there has been a lot of knowledge sharing education between lenders and, and bureaus and all parties to say the data is FCRA compliant. It is displayable, disputable, correctable, and you can use it for lending. And therefore, there is this need or this ask from 
lenders to pick up new tools, right? And drive transition from legacy score models that they may be using, because there are viable solutions out there that actually incorporate all of the different data assets and new you know, machine learning techniques and analytics to help address that population that we're all talking about. Yeah, so uh, as a lender, I totally agree. I think making that uh, this data element as FCRA compliant, uh, one box got checked. The other is also about how easy to integrate the data and also make it integratable so that we can actually do a retrospective kind of analysis to understand on top of the traditional credit bureau files, how this incremental data elements increase the risk of separation. I think that's a critical component of course, the third box would be how easy would that be to incorporate into the production flow, which I'm sure like the API flow, everything is what Sarah Alpa have been probably talking with many lenders to make it as easy as possible, almost like a plug and play and a switch on. That would be ideal. Um, but in terms of the um, uh, scorable, non-scorable, I would say that's not the most uh, or the biggest pain point uh, from at least in my own perspective, because there are certain things we can tolerate. For instance, we have uh, customized internal uh, in-house build kind of customized models and plus this uh, customer permissioned data elements. And we can actually come up with some kind of solutions that will allow us to either you say cherry pick or at least safely test certain credit boxes along the way, right? I think it's a test and learn framework, it really works. Um, I would say the other thing we need to balance also is about in the process of testing, how much we're willing to take between the balance of, I mean, to balance the, the risk appetite as well as the friction you're creating along the way because making the frictionless is ab absolutely everybody wants to do but at the same time we have to consider how much uncertainties because of the this evolving customer behavior changes along the way right we're able to predict with relatively uh, like a confident kind of uh, uh, risk projection yeah i think it's like the uh i would say uh core um challenges or questions we want to solve with uh, data providers yeah right so alpha can i go back to you and ask about the like the challenges working with lenders like prosper i mean they all have their existing systems um this this new kinds of data sometimes you know, obviously it's it's a challenge i mean what what um Haiyan just said there about uh integrating it i mean what what is that is that the biggest challenge the, the that's sort of that's holding holding lenders back or what's been your experience yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think there's, it varies, right? Depending on the type of lender, the size, right? Um, a, a challenges for a credit union are probably very different from a, a fintech lender like Prosper, right? Um, they vary depending on, you know, not just the technology integrations, but also, you know, the, the, the skill sets within the organizations of, you know, when it comes to model risk, right? Or governance around that and understanding you know, are you comfortable with machine learning techniques? Um, what type of analytics are being leveraged? So there is a pretty broad spectrum on like different um, areas to address. But as you kind of go universally across, I think um, I mentioned previously that, you know, a couple of years ago, it was about education and informing that these data assets are regulated, right? So great, mm -hmm. check the box to high end's point. Now it's evolving into, you know, integrations. There's a lot of companies or lenders out there that have complex systems, right? And we as, a, as an organization absolutely have made it easy where it's a plug and play as best described, right? So as models update, as attributes update, it's through single API calls and those are integrating into their systems or their LOS systems. Um, but they also have a multitude of systems on their side that they've got to go and update and, you know, assess along the way. And then there's that model governance piece and an analytics piece, right? It's that um, additional consulting and um, analytics asks that have to come into play too to help understand because a lot of our new models have machine learning techniques built into it, AI built into it. And that's partably due to leveraging some of these alternative data assets or expanded FCRA data assets that we now see you know, the consumer is scorable, but they also perform quite well. And we have to partner very closely with lenders to show them that the performance is good by mm -hmm. leveraging this type of data and analytics. So it's solving all that together is, you know, it's a lot to work through, but it's doable. And especially in this day and age, it's completely, you know, 
um, possible, right? The art of possible is there now. Right, right. So, so Sarah, what about what about you guys at Nova Credit? I mean, you're also working with lenders and bringing in different types of data sets. I mean, how how is that? How is integration? Is it, do you do you sort of um, align with everything Alpa said there, or what's been your experience? Yeah, I mean, I think I think Alpa's you know beautifully captured. Um, in fact, actually, I'm, I'm really appreciating the contrast between Alpha's sort of capturing the complexity of, of this whole environment and Haiyan saying we need something that sort of check the box and, and simple. And I think, you know, we at Nova Credit certainly have, you know, we have an appreciation for the nuances and the complexity of bringing in a new data solution and bringing in some new techniques. But we also think it's our responsibility to actually sort of um, sort of simplify all of this wherever we possibly can. So, you know, we've built the APIs. We've done a lot of the pre-work to understand the risk insight associated with the data such that we can at least try to give to our customer, you know, a, a playbook, so to speak, that, that helps uh, them understand exactly where and how to use this data uh, and to do it um, as, you know, as we recognized in a risk managed way, in a governance way that sort of allows us to maintain the FCRA uh, criteria and allows us to understand the core implications and things like that. Um, and so, you know, there's there's a there's a middle ground here. I think that we we as um, solution providers have a responsibility to the industry, which mm -hmm. is to not recreate an entirely new underwriting system, right. to you know to to build out you know ten digit scores or whatever, but to leverage the existing infrastructure, the existing language. Uh, concepts and do what we can to bring new solutions into that space, but also then sort of to move the, the industry forward a little bit uh, so that they're not sort of stuck, you know, still within the same box. So so it's it's a little bit of, of, um, of a sort of a joint leadership environment, I think, between, and then Alpha said this very well, between uh, the solution provider and, and, the, and the customer. Um, we want to learn together but I think we have this capacity, as I say, to really deliver uh, a powerful solution that that can be implemented really very, very easily um, with the right kind of leadership around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to add a bit, uh, or maybe Sarah can add as well, is uh, about the the incentives to consumers, right? Because this mm -hmm. needs permission from the consumers. And at the same time, I think Alpa mentioned about experience boost. That means okay, give us more data that can potentially boost your score. I think that's a clear line for the incentive, whereas for, I think that it also provides educational opportunities to consumers in terms of why do I want to create, provide my bank information to you, right, as a lender. And then that, again, is uh, something that we want to work on in terms of how to really minimize the friction at the same time, getting the right information to allow them to go through a, I would say, a easier path. Or, or a easier uh, treatment. So at the same time, I think when we're talking about earlier, uh, either credit uh, inscorable or inactive or thing five population, and then we have to acknowledge the fraud, that there's also a, a fraud space there, right? I think the challenge for lenders is also about the uncertainties or the confidence level in terms of uh, how much data can provide you how much confidence correspondingly in terms of projecting the law, uh, projecting the potential uh, risks. So I, will, I want to highlight the consumer permission part as a, a continuous kind of a, a space that we want to look into. And the other is about potential fraud. Yeah. Right, right. And then I, I do want to, I want to, we we're getting several questions coming in here and I do want to get to them in a second, but before we do, um, I want to talk about compliance, FCRA uh, compliance. Maybe Alpha, you can address this and like to make this data FCR compliant. I mean, how what is Experian doing? How are you how are you working to make it easy for lenders to maintain their compliance? Yeah, absolutely. So for again, from our perspective, when we, so we start to bring this data in, if you take like Experian Boost as an example you know, consumers connecting to their bank account were able to pull down and categorize utility, telco, streaming services. That's immediately being added to your credit report. So it is FCRA compliant. So meaning a consumer can come in and dispute the information, correct the information. They're effectively the data furnisher, but that's how we're making the data. It's just data. It's FCRA data, you know, compliant and again, displayable, disputable, correctable. 
The data that doesn't flow directly into a core credit report, like other assets, like alternative data assets, like Clarity, for example, that also sits in a regulated database. And again, mm -hmm. it's all FCRA compliant, where you then can come in as a consumer, you know, correct it, you know, dispute the information. And that's that's the line we tow, right? When we talk about leveraging data for credit decisioning, that data is FCRA compliant from our perspective. Right, right. Uh, so can, I ask, uh, can I ask a question, Peter? I would love to hear from Alpa and Hyatt. How you guys think about disparate impact with uh, consumer permission data? How, how do you understand that and how do you evaluate that? Yeah, I think um, in terms of this uh, uh, negative impact, what we are taking the approach is, uh, uh, of course, we're not treating people differently depending on their demographic information. But the true um, uh, really uh, differentiator is about are they willing to provide additional data? Mm -hmm. Are they giving the permission? That's the step one. I think if they give the permission, then of course the information we use is again, uh, based on the FCRA compliant information, right? But at the same time, in terms of uh, um, disparagement treatments, um, I would say it's again, uh, we use the same approach to look at uh, what actual performance looks like, right? Okay. If actual performance, you can find high risk, and then that's the approach you take across the board. That I don't think there's any kind of a fair lending or compliance concerns. Um, and uh, we're not using anything outside of that credit uh, permission kind of uh, uh, attribute list. Um, that's what we we take. So yeah. We follow FCRA, ECOA, fair lending guidelines and requirements, right? And I'll use the example of clarity data. So the data that we build our solutions off of is built off of inquiry. When the data is coming in, we're not collecting information on race or ethnicity, right? So the, the, the data that's there is not, you know, inherently creating disparate impact. And we've even taken a step further in some of our solutions around, you know, uh, for example, Lyft Premium. We've gone to outside counsel and had a fair lending analysis and actually looked at the data that's coming in to build this score, this generic score, and done assessments to say, no, you know, these attributes are right, okay to be used um, and they're not causing disparate impact. So recognizing that is a concern, but we're taking it very seriously as we always do, but making sure on top of it by doing these types of analysis to ensure that the disparate impact is not there. Yeah. So can we, can, can I ask about boost? I mean, is like just the fact that you know, you're advertising on TV I and mean, I've seen them, I think there was a Super Bowl ad even a couple of years ago from memory. Um, are you finding the uptake of that? I mean, because it's because it's open to everybody. Are there certain classes, or certain protected classes that uptake that less? And how do you know that's not happening? So um, I, I will probably won't comment on. We don't believe it's a certain protected classes, but there are consumers that are generally more thin file subprime consumers that are coming in and opting into add their traded their boosted trade lines, right? And they're seeing incremental benefit, right? We have about 9 million consumers that actually have come in and boosted and have seen about an average of 13 point score increase with their FICO score. That's pretty phenomenal, right? Um, and so we do look at, you know, historically, you could probably make the argument like what geographic, what race and ethnicity is there. But at the end of the day, they're seeing positive lift in their score. They're saying, you know, performance, we're seeing positive performance of these consumers. It's helping these consumers right. because again, it comes back to thin file subprime segments where it's helping them the most. And also, you know, just adding overall benefit to them as they participate and try to go for more different financial products. Right, right. Um, I, there's a lot of questions coming in here. So I wanna, I wanna start addressing some of these. Um, Maybe we can, maybe let's get this one. We've just been talking about FCRA compliance. So what are your thoughts on incorporating consumer permission FCRA compliant um, direct from source payroll account data into credit decisioning? Um, I, I think my perspective would be as provided that the data continues to conform to all the parameters that we've all just talked about and it validates uh, from, uh, you know, no disparate uh, treatment basis. Um, again, it's a it's a powerful uh, powerful source of data. One of the things we do um, with one of our uh, partners is we actually import 
um, bank account data, looking at just the inflow side of it and create um, income insights associated with it. Well, I mean, you know, we're already seeing as an industry uh, income estimation, um, income analysis, uh, mm -hmm. Premium payroll information is just another part of the portfolio of, of data tools that should be available and that we should have a system and an environment available to incorporate that information. Right, right. I'll just add a quick thing. I think um, the challenge or, or the, yeah, incorporating the whole thing into a credit decision name, uh, even though it's FCRA compliant, I would say the challenge probably is about because it's customer permission, whether that down the road will create some kind of different treatments in terms of, uh, hey, I'm willing to provide something additional versus I'm not. Uh, so that creates some kind of uh, challenges in terms of uh, how we set up this uh, pass environment, right? To make sure it's definitely uh, fair and then transparent and uh, all the full disclosure has been presented to, to the consumers what in terms of uh, what this data can be used for and then what kind of differences it could make yeah we're not quite that's yet. one of the that's one of the biggest challenges with with consumer permission data isn't it uh and i know alpa you've you've you were talking about and i were talking about this a, a few weeks ago that um you know what happens when the consumer chooses not to link all of the information and they are creating some perhaps self-selection you know they're biasing only in the positive right. side of their story as opposed to the full story um, and I think that's that's the, the I think one of the, the challenges within the industry um, of how do you look at the data and un understand if a consumer is is biasing the information. Um, you know, we're starting to build some solutions into that space that I think, you know, once you solve that problem, you end up, I think, really having tremendous confidence in the quality of the data and its holistic expression. Um, and that's where we as an industry need to head. Right, right. I couldn't agree more. I think it's really important to like, because consumers, you're right, there could be that element of self-selection, right? I only yeah. want to contribute my positive data, or I only want to connect this bank account and not this bank account. But ultimately, what we got to look at is, you know, solutions to solve for that. But again, it's about the performance, right? As you look at these consumers that have opted in to share their information, they're performing quite well. They're not going delinquent, right? They're mm -hmm bad rates are below the US average bad rates, right? And those are positive signs. So it goes back to like, yes, yeah. there's this element of self-selection, but it's well-deserved because the credit that they did receive because they're continuing to perform, they're paying their bills. They've got the new different credit card and now they're continuing their payments. So I think we've got to balance that with, you know, the reward that they got and they continue to make their payments, it shows. Right, right. Okay, we have some more questions here. And if you have a question, uh, please hit the Q&A button and not the chat button. The, the Q&A button helps us record it all. So if you could um, do that when you're asking a question, that would be appreciated. There's a very long question here. I'm going to paraphrase talking about um, women in the workforce and how a lot of people left over the last two years because of COVID to, be, to take care of, uh, of kids or loved ones at home. Um, losing losing two years potentially of work history which a lot of lenders of, require and do you see the industry coming up with better models to bring more equitability to this population um, that is, so they're not left behind yeah i'm happy to jump in so work history on a credit report is um consumer contributed as well right it's not built into the calculation itself of the algorithm but i think where we need to head as a as an industry is we need to move away from some of the legacy traditional scoring models. Right. We need to start to, again, leverage consumer permission data. We need to start to leverage other expanded FCRA data assets. There are other scores out there in the marketplace, Lyft Premium being one of them, where we incorporate not just credit data, but all of rent bureau data we look at. We look at clarity data assets. We look at a variety of different data assets. We look at full file public records and all that's brought together to give you credit effectively for everything that you've been doing. And so again, it goes back to like, we need to start to move away from those traditional scoring models into some of the newer scoring models that actually help consumers like you, you know, get back into whatever you are looking to get back into from a, a credit perspective. 
Mm -hmm. and I would just add here, I think that means even more critical in terms of what additional data they're willing to provide. Because uh, like Alpa said, yeah, credit bureau is telling a long long term story. At the same time, the unemployment status for women, for instance, during the pandemic, if you zoom in, probably largely is due to either the insert service industry, which is recovering, uh, lagging a little bit, or they they are caregivers, right? So it's not like uh, there are not enough jobs out there. One job. One unemployment um, probably is referring to mapping to 1.7 job opportunities out there. So I think that means if they're open to give permissions to access more data to lenders, I think that probably even increasing more credit access to this population. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is where I think bank data actually becomes a, just a natural solution, doesn't it? Right. I mean, 90 percent of the population have a bank account and it's not reliant on how you're using credit. It's how you're managing your finances. So whether you're in the workforce or not, you're yeah. still needing to manage within a particular financial footprint. And so this notion of affordability, which is what bank data can bring to the table, um, is I think a very powerful insight. You know, you can't, you're not likely or not likely to pay a debt, which is what credit scores work on, um, unless you have, you can afford to pay it. So bank data can actually sort of get you one step further up up the top of the funnel by understanding your, your picture of your financial health as opposed to how likely you are to pay a debt. So a lot of, lot of pluses, I think, that um, are embedded within using bank data. Um, and I think part of what our responsibility is in the industry is to focus on that and maximize that, like Boost does and other scores, rather than saying these are all the reasons why it can't work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, um, there's an interesting question here that really is the opposite of the, what you were just talking about there, Sarah. So what are the cons for a large banking institution in leveraging banking data for targeting and managing loan product offerings? Any cons? <laughs> well, the one I, and I, in fairness, I did volunteer one of the big cons, which is the self-selection challenge. Right. right. So, um, you know, does the consumer with the 25 insufficient fund events in their one account not link that one, but puts all the put, links, all the other accounts, which have all kinds of positive information. Um, and I, I think that's a, a real concern um, that we, again, as I said, as an industry have to um, have to find a solution through and, and resolve. We're looking at some a lot of analytics right now to try to understand, can we see triggers in the data to note that somebody isn't linking all their information and therefore prompt the issuer to go back to the consumer and say, hey, we think you've got a bigger picture here and it's really important we see the whole story. Um, so I, I own that one as, as uh, one of the challenges of, of the data. Uh, anybody else? <laughs> Yeah, I agree with you. I think, you know, self-selection to your point, Sarah, it, it's it's real, it's there. But I think I, I feel like I'm setting a bit of broken record here, but that's why all this other data is important too, right? As long as you start to bring that other data in um, alongside the consumer permission data, you start to paint that full 360 degree view. So you can minimize your risk and really understand what's happening with the consumer, right? Just because they linked up one bank account and all of a sudden it's insufficient and they disconnect, we don't want that, but bringing in other data assets and there are data assets that have cash flow, check caching, you know, check writing services out there that that data is coming in. And that's another viable way to say, well, what's happening with this consumer? What has happened, right? Leveraging income and employment data. That's another way to say, well, they're experiencing some type of hardship because they no longer have a, a job or something like that. All that can come together to paint that picture to give you that full picture of the consumer. So there's a combination of all this that really needs to come to, to come to life to really understand a consumer. Right, and also uh, to be fair, I'm going to give some credit for the selection bias because there could be positive selection for people who are more willing to provide bank accounts versus some uh, someone, for instance, with malicious intent or <laughs> fraudsters to provide uh, the, the bank account access. So I think there's a, some kind of positive selection over there as well. Of course, I fully acknowledge, I think when people culturally select which bank account to allow us to see, then they obviously wouldn't, wouldn't give us the non-sufficient fund one, right? So mm -hmm. the, the, the two sides, both sides are there. Right. And if I can just add in one more piece for this, I think we, we have to recognize that I think these new uh, data solutions actually can bring in 
powerfully a powerful improvement in predictive insight and risk assessment. You know, we've done some analysis where we see a prime portfolio where adding in just bank data alone uh, improves the predictive insight by over 25%. 25% lift on your existing um, you know, statistical performance is remarkable. So this is not just data that is marginally better for the, the lending industry. It's actually, I think, a sea change in terms of the, the power of the industry's capacity to manage losses. Right, right. So maybe this is, uh, this is one for Alpa. I mean, what, what is the consumer given to see after they've, um, after they've given permission to utilize their data? Um, do these companies send the consumer a report? I mean, it's <clears throat> maybe you could explain about what Experian, how Experian Boost works, um, and uh, you know what, what's how how it looks to the consumer. Absolutely. So um, you could log on to Experian.com and you would sign up for an Experian.com um, account, and you would go through a journey with credit education along the way, where you're asked or prompted to connect a bank account. So you're a whole list of your variety of banks that we're connected to will pop up. You will then be asked to put your credentials in. Um, in the background, we'll obviously pull all that information in, categorize it, and then just create and generate. And that data then is effectively added to your credit report in real time. But before you commit, you have the opportunity to see your score and see what impact it has. Once you commit, you can then say yes, those data, those data assets or trade lines are added to your credit report and you are generated a new score. Now, from a consumer report standpoint, when you go and pull your credit report, it appears like any diff no different than any a trade line that's on your on your credit report. It is designated as a consumer permission trade. So it's flagged and you can identify that that's a trade that you added. But effectively, it looks like any other credit report and it's displayed on your credit report. So we're really trying to make it easy as possible. We didn't, you know, don't want to add a lot of complexity to it. But, you know, along that journey, there's a lot of education, too, on what's it doing, what's the benefits, you know, what's happening behind the scenes. Um, but that also dovetails into another product that we've just launched, Experian Go. So Experian Go for consumers that are new to credit or just turned 18, potentially moved to this country um, from another place, obviously, that you know they had now can go in and actually enter their social security number, have that verified, um, have their driver's license verified and start to create uh, a credit profile. So at that point we create a credit header and then we ask you to come in and boost and also create a credit profile. So there's a lot of different solutions. And again, keeping it very simple and easy and digestible is important for us and our consumers and helping them understand because it is complex. It isn't easy to always to understand what's happening, but it's a it's a traditional credit report that would show those trade lines that you've added um, or opted to add into your credit report. But what about actual bank transaction data pulling? Because you're you're just your I think Experian boost and actually maybe you can just explain yeah. um, how where bank transaction data actually fits. So we leverage pipes through Finicity or that's our partner. And when we pull the bank transaction information, there's actually like a categorized engine categorization engine that sits on top. That raw transaction information is then essentially converted into a trade line that is then displayed onto the credit report. So in that scenario, it's utility, telco, uh, streaming services. Those are the types of information that we're extracting from the, the banking data or the raw transaction data itself. Outside of that, that data, we're not, we're not leveraging it, but you can, you can also look at the raw transaction data information if the consumer opts for it. And so future ideas include, you know, you can look at the cash flow, you can look at you can calculate your assets, you can calculate your income, right? Those are other solutions, again, all leveraging that categorization engine. And in those cases, you would also output a verification of asset in, um, report or a verification of income import or a verification of employment report. And those are reports that would then show your employment history or your income history that's associated to it. Again, all based on that categorization engine that's like pulling the information and making it readable and digestible by the consumer. Okay. So then um, maybe let's see, we got lots and lots of questions to choose from here. We're not, we're not gonna be able to get to all of them, I'm afraid. Um, does a consumer permissioning their data introduce friction into the bank flow? 
is this the price for transparency? Yeah, hi, Anne. <laughs> start. Yeah. yeah, I would say it definitely adds one more step uh, for the consumers, right? So again, like that's the part that we're trying to uh, solve is uh, is this a must have step or is it a nice to have step? And then what's the benefit to the consumers if they 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 go through this step? So uh, the short answer would be yes. Um, any additional step, you probably will lose some consumers along the way. But the, at the same time, um, time proves if we're able to actually add additional data points and then do more precise um, and the writing and the verification, it does goes a long way in terms of loss management and uh, create a better path and a funnel for, for majority of the consumers down the road. If I may add also, I think um, it's also viewed as a second chance. So consumers that may have been declined, you know, are more likely to are, you know, not to say they're okay with friction, but they're more likely to go through a secondary process to add their in, or, you know, provide their credentials, I should say, and therefore pulling that bank account information into you know, an ultra FICO score, for example, right? So you've gone through the process. Unfortunately, you didn't meet the, the lender's criteria. You're now facing, you know, you have adverse action um, that's been delivered back to you in your credit report. But then they give you this option to say, well, do you want to connect? And we can give you a second chance. I think in those circumstances, that changes the level of friction that a consumer is willing to go through because now we can extract that cash flow information from that bank account information and, and it funnels up to a new version of the, what we call ultra FICO score. And therefore now you're scorable and your lender may be able to give you a product that is suitable for your, for your needs. Right, and I'd also argue that it's getting more and more common. I mean, connecting your bank account through Plaid happens so in so many different ways these days that I think the, <clears throat> while the friction will, will remain, it will always remain, there'll be some friction. I feel like people are, are, are seeing it more. And when the more you see it, the less it's going to be an obstacle. So it seems like yeah. to me anyway. I think that's and, a good well, point. and also for the newer generation, right? They're so used to everything is on the app and everything like they're more willing. They're more digital savvy, they're more willing to say, hey, everything goes through all these steps and I provide my credential, everything connected and I'm done, right? So I think there's also consumer behavior and adoption kind of a, a trend going on right now. Right, right. Okay, here's an interesting one. How do you anticipate consumer permission data will hold up on predicting losses uh, for a potential upcoming recession or pressure in the credit markets? Uh, that's a million dollar question. It is, isn't it? <laughs> 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 I can take a share of that. And yeah. I think just like any data elements, right? When we talk about recession and what the performance, when you drill down to the bottom question is really about how can people afford the ability to pay, right? On top of all the obligations they have. But I think what we have gone through during the pandemic recession was there are reliefs available. There are certain kind of, uh, um, I would say, um, re re uh, uh, like skip payment kind of uh, 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 accommodation programs available as well. So it's not like uh, during the older, I mean, earlier time recession time, it's really you see the sharp increase at some time point. But again, even that um, translate to different kind of longer term through the cycle loss projections by different risk tiers differently. Um, so I don't want to go to the, the details, but I think for this uh, consumer permission data, assuming like for instance, accessing bank um, transaction data, we can see healthy cash flow. So that combined with, okay, potential likelihood of uh, unemployment uh, rate increase during the next recession. And for instance, when we talk about uh, Fed rate hiking more aggressively down the road in the next 12 months or until 2023, uh, how that translates to the impact of their payment shocks along the way. I think this provides more insights for sure. It doesn't solve the problem to say, hey, are these people all, always safe to land? And then in terms of how much dollar amount in the next recession, we cannot answer that simple that question with simple additional data elements. But I think the in additional insights are really the value um, uh, resides. And, and the recency, right, Hyan? I think, yeah. you know, the fact mm -hmm. that you can pull this data, you're not waiting for the 30 day yeah. update cycle. Yeah. I mean, that's very powerful insight that, you know, when you're making a, a decision, knowing what this, this consumer looks like as of yesterday, so to speak, um, that's powerful. And I yeah. think that can help mitigate some of the dynamics that we'll, we'll see um, going forward. 
Um, and it's, that's again, a very strong player, a uh, powerful part of, of bank data. Okay. Um, here's another one. What are the mechanisms currently being employed for CDP? And I presume that means customer data um, platform, but for CDP consent management, revocation and transparency across the data management life cycle. Wow. Wow. Does anyone want to, want to give that a... Uh, You want to pass? <laughs> we got lots Peter, more to talk about. Can you repeat the question? Is there so question what are what other the... mechanisms currently being employed for CDP consent management, revocation, and transparency across the data management lifecycle? That's a very big question, uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> and um, you know, I think you know transparently. I think we need the right technologists to start to talk about you know data life cycle management and how we manage it on a on a high level look we take it very seriously right and you know where you hold consent how consumers revoke that consent is a, a really important matter to us how the data is stored and when it's then revoked um, how it's being removed from multiple systems is incredibly critical i think every company out there manages it slightly different, but there is, you know, again, it's of the utmost importance of all of us. And we're going to continue to invest in the technology security to make sure that we protect the consumers and that lifecycle management of, of the data as it flows through all of our systems, as it's used for lending decisions, or if it's used for another use case that the consumer is permissioned and consented it's for. And it's, it's complex because, you know, for organizations like us, we have multiple different business units, right? And different use cases that apply and different ways of collecting consent. And that that changes how you manage your data and where it sits and how it's stored and whether you put it in a regulated database or whether you don't. Those are all things that are driven by making sure that we maintain consumers' privacy and security of that data. Okay, so let's move on. Um... We have a, uh, a question from Ramona. She's enjoying the webinar. Thank you. In order to build a robust score model by analyzing the bank account data together with all other data, of course, available, how many months of, a stock of historic data should you be able to see? In, 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 I'm, is it months in terms of performance data? Is no, it's months, months. Like, yeah, it's, it's basically how, many, how far back do you want you need to go in analyzing bank account data? You know, it, that's going to depend on the kind of model you're building. Um, I suppose if you're if you're looking at uh, if you're looking at loss prediction um, or affordability, you know, perhaps you, you you certainly want to have at least from an affordability perspective, 90 days. Ideally, you'd like to go back uh, 12 to 18 months in terms of looking at the financial sort of flows, cash flows in terms of the observation data set um, and performance. Then is you know six to 12 months out past. Um, all of that behavioral information. Um, what we're looking at in terms of the way we're analyzing the data is we're sort of leveraging a lot of, let's call it again, common uh, starting points for how you look at credit risk modeling uh, and then seeing where we go from there in terms of what's necessary for statistical robustness, uh, but also what can you, what do you absolutely need to have from the consumer friction perspective, right? Waiting for minutes to pull your bank data in is not going to be something that's appealing to a consumer. So there's a trade-off in that conversation. Right. right. Okay. Uh, another interesting one. BNPL is obviously a hot topic still. What? And I know that uh, maybe this one's for you, Alpa. What's the impact of the new relationships with BNPL operators reporting installment plans? Is that auto-reported or consumer opted in? <laughs> So buy now, pay later loans are, some of them are reported into the Bureau. Um, there's a lot of discussions that are being had right now on, you know, rep getting reporting in general from the buy now, pay later lenders, um, because it is an area that's not openly reported data. And so you got to remember, it's a very different type of, it's not your traditional credit product or credit loan that they're getting. This is payments in four to six weeks, right? And so if you think about the, the reporting um, timelines that we have from data furnishers, those are on every 30 days. If you think about a buy now, pay later loan, by the time, you know, from day one to day 30, 
that loan or those terms that you have with this buy now, pay later are over. So there's a lot of conversations mm -hmm. on, you know, this type of data is very different than your traditional credit data because of the type of product that the consumer is obtaining, the type of terms they're receiving. Now um, we are looking at as, you know, it being predictive and can you build again, scores, models, attributes off of that. And it, that is of value to a lot of consumers because we do find a large part of the population now entering that space. I'm sure everyone on this call has probably played around with buy now, pay later a little bit to some degree. And so you don't want that to just enter the credit ecosystem because you know you have five or six payments in one month and that does impact your score. So how do you start to treat those you know, trade lines or that data that's coming in? So a lot more conversation to be had, a lot more to be learned in the industry overall. Um, I don't know, Haiyan, maybe you wanna comment a little bit too. Um, yeah, we definitely want to see the data for sure. And we also fully appreciate the fact that not wisely using data could negatively impacting the business and impacting how you acquire consumers. Just so given the short term impact with this kind of repeated behavior. Uh, and it's a it's a growing uh, segment for sure in terms of, uh, uh, for instance, right now, probably one third of the US consumers have done by now pay later one way or the other. So that's definitely one trend that we don't want to ignore. Um, but then having that data available and also having the payment behavior and the late, uh, for instance, delinquency status available definitely are giving us additional um, data points. And then just to, to echo what we said, it just completes the 360 view. It doesn't mean all in all connecting the dots will translate to negative impact to the consumers. That's what we want to emphasize. Yeah. Right, right, and I, we should. I should also I'll give a, give Experian a plug here because you guys have your have just created your own uh, credit bureau, especially for buy now pay later. I interviewed Greg Wright of Experian on my podcast just last month, and he, where he talks all about that. So that's uh, that's a whole that's that's a that's a bigger topic than what we're covering today. Um, we're running out of time, but maybe but Peter, uh, if, I, if I could though, I, I do think we are just triggering on buy now pay later the COVID reporting dynamics. I think we are in a little bit of a perfect storm for credit risk analytics, which is again why I want to encourage you know everybody that's sort of listening to this to really be open and receptive to new data solutions. Uh, you know, scores are built on you know several years of data, all of which is at the moment a little bit sort of not standard. And so I think we're all responsible if we're going to keep a sort of well-managed uh, ecosystem to looking at for looking at new data to to enhance what we're seeing in terms of deficiencies in the way scores are beha behaving right now right right okay well um i think what, what what we'll close with we've only got a couple of minutes left here i'd like to hear from each of you about what looking looking into the future um talking about you know three to five years time what um what do you guys see and what 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 what, what do you think is exciting um hi i'll start with you yeah, I think what's exciting is uh, what I want to see is uh, I have a full um, shelf of uh, toolboxes. Right? I want data, I want insights, I want models, I want uh, uh, everything is automated, right? So that's what I'm really um, targeting at. Yeah. All right. Alpha? Yeah, so... Um... You know, I'd love to see that in a we're in a place where we're scoring 100% of Americans, right? We're bringing all this data and consumer permission is just kicking off. Like we have probably just scratch, scratched the surface of the type of data that we can start to bring in. And it's really predictive. Consumers perform well and they see the benefit and lenders see the benefit as well. You know, areas like buy now, pay later are going to help this um, along with consumer permission data. So I think we're entering exciting times. Um, I think the momentum is definitely there. Lenders and bureaus and other companies are really starting to partner together and bring together technology. So a lot of good things to come. And again, solving you know, real consumer problems, right? And again, it goes back to, we get to have to solve that. We get to solve that problem of actually making everyone scorable and give them fair access to credit. Yep, yep. Okay, Sarah, last word to you. Um, I just echo what uh, these guys are saying. You know, I think bank data, and I'm gonna place a big bet on bank data. I think it's the next inevitable innovation. Um, it solves exactly what we've been talking about today. Um, and I think in five years time, we will have retired the term financial inclusion. We won't need it anymore. 
Well, that will be a good day. It's a great, a great, a great point to end on. So, thank you, ladies. It was a really fascinating discussion. Thank you, of course, the audience uh, for for watching. Sorry, we couldn't get to all of the questions. We we did have a large number that came in. So glad you found it engaging, and uh, you know, thanks again, also to Nova Credit for uh, for pulling us all this pulling this together and for supporting it. Okay, have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.